We're involved in a series called The Road to Recovery. There are eight principles that uh, are significant on this road to recovery. And uh, I thought I would do this in four or five weeks. I could do two principles a week, but it's not happening. So we'll preach all eight principles, taking a break the last Sunday of the month to um, preach the first sermon I, I ever preached. So since it's only going to be 12 minutes on the last Sunday of the month, today is an hour and 12 minutes. <laughs> Uh, if, if you want to catch up on the previous principles, you can go to the website. The messages are there, all right, and you can catch up. Today I'm not doing any review. Usually I'll go back and hit the previous ones. We'll, we'll do that again next week. But today we're just going to jump right in and talk about uh, principle number five, which is the transformation step. This is the making change it step on the road to recovery. Several years ago I had the privilege of owning a motorhome. It was a used one. Uh, bought it from where Chick Passarella was working at the time. And um, I discovered what many boat owners discover once I bought a uh, motorhome. And that is uh, the best day in your life is the day you buy it. And the second best day in your life is the day that you sell it. All right? Yeah. And, and we have boat sellers here. All right? So, uh, yeah, Lacefield, Boner Boats. Uh, but but it was, that was my experience. All right? Uh, it, it, I would have been a lot of money ahead if I had just rented a motorhome whenever I chose to take a trip than to actually own it. But, um, and especially when your first trip in that motorhome, uh, you get robbed. Um, Parked right underneath a light with a sign that said, this parking lot under 24-hour video surveillance. And it was. It was. It showed the people on the video camera unloading the stuff out of our RV into their Cadillac convertible. Just right in it, man. Uh, but anyway, uh, motorhomes, they're pretty amazing these days. Motorhomes have allowed us to put all of the conveniences of our home on wheels. A person who used to go camping no longer needs to be content with sleeping in a sleeping bag on hard ground or hauling wood to a campsite to cook over a fire or hauling water to drink and maybe take a spit bath from, from a stream. Now we can park a fully equipped home on a cement slab in the midst of a few pine trees, hook up a water line, a sewer system, and electricity. I've seen motorhomes with satellite dishes, bump out rooms, and video cameras for backing up. There's no more bother with dirt, no more smoke from a fire, no more drudgery of walking to the stream. It is now possible to go camping and never step foot outside. <laughs> we buy a motorhome with a hope of seeing new places, of getting out into the world, yet we deck it out with furnishings that look just like our living room, so nothing really changes. We may drive to a new place, set ourselves in new surroundings, but the newness goes unnoticed, for we've carried along all of our old stuff. Unfortunately, that happens a lot in this adventure that we call life in Christ, is we keep hauling around the comfortable old stuff with us, and we never see the new vistas that God has in store for us. You see, we all have hurts from our past that are hard to forget. We all have hang-ups that we just assume we'll never get rid of this side of heaven. And we all have habits that sneak up on us and still create havoc in our lives. We've seen in this series on the road to recovery. We've seen this on the road to recovery. Today, we're going to look at step number five. This is the transformation step. This is the V in the word recovery. Remember the eight steps all come from the acrostic R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y. So today we're going to look at the V. And here's what the V stands for. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life. And humbly ask him to remove my character defects. I would simply modify that in one little bit. What I would say at the end is to not just remove, but to replace my character defects. For every one of my fleshly character defects, the Holy Spirit has a fruit of the Spirit that he would like to replace it with. He's not going to leave a void when he removes it. He is going to replace it with something better. That's why it's called transformation. Transformation. 
This sermon series is not designed for all of you to show up on Thursday night to celebrate recovery. Part of it is designed to make you aware, if you didn't know, that we do have a ministry at New Hope called Celebrate Recovery. They look at these eight principles and they go through the 12 steps, all right, uh, which these eight principles are involved with. And that does take place. But I want you to know this road to recovery is for all of us, whether we step foot into a Celebrate Recovery program or not. We're all in need of recovery from our sinful past. And these are important steps for us to look at. But if yours happen to be a little deeper hurt, <laughs> a little uglier habit, uh, a little more devastating hang up, and you need mm, the accountability and the opportunity to walk along with others, celebrate recovery is available on Thursday night. One of the things I want you to know about CR is it is absolutely a safe place. There's a thing that they say at every meeting at the end. What happens here, what is said here, stays here, here, here. <laughs> And that's the way it ends. It's a very safe place. That being said, I showed you a testimony last week from a member of Celebrate Recovery. I'm showing you another one today. I want you to know we don't take these without their knowledge and participation. <laughs> We are not show. In other words, I don't want you to think if you show up to celebrate recovery, somebody's going to do a video of you and put it on the big screen in church. Okay? No. These, these, these are both folks who volunteered, okay, a willingness to do this, but it's to put a face uh, to recovery. And so last week you saw one. Today we're going to see another one. Let's watch. Hi, my name is Kim. I have a new life in Christ. I struggle with codependency, fear of man, and people pleasing. I started attending Celebrate Recovery about two and a half years ago because the pain that I was feeling from my shame, the anxiety um, from my fear of abandonment um, was just too much for me to, to bear. I um, had been really um, good at wearing masks and um, making it seem as though my life was really good on the outside but no one really knew what I was feeling on the inside. So when um, day when I was praying and just asking God, what do I do? Please tell me what to do. Celebrate Recovery kept coming to my mind and um, I thought, well, I mean, I guess what can it hurt? I mean, I'll go to a meeting and see if it's something that um, would work. And so I remember walking in the doors the very first night and being um, welcomed by just some really loving people. And it just felt like such an incredibly safe environment and I could be me. And not only could I be me, but I also felt no judgment um, because I was with people who were like me, people who were hurting, people who had their hangups um, and their habits. It's easy to get discouraged because there are times that I um, take one or two steps back, um, but I have to remember that this is a lifelong journey. Um, I will be doing this for the rest of my life. Um, that I've got God on my side, and um, through His power, uh, change can really occur. Um, the healing can really occur, and um, I've got a long way to go, but at least I know now that I've got hope, and I feel it. I don't feel the tremendous shame and condemnation that I used to feel, that used to make me feel like I couldn't go on any longer. So I just ask that um, any of you that are hurting or feel that you've got something that you need to deal with, um, give it a try. Um, come to Celebrate Recovery and um, learn a little bit more about um, this healing process. Amen. Before I jump back in the sermon, it's a good time. My wife told me I made a snafu during announcements. I said that tonight's service was at 6. That's wrong. It's at 5. Okay? So don't show up at 6 because you'll miss it. So it's at 5 o'clock tonight. Many people tend to think that this road to recovery is just for alcoholics who need to get sober. That a road to recovery is just for addicts who need to get clean. But here's what I want you to know. That recovery is what Jesus has in store for all of us. You see, there are some folks who need to recover from being unkind, and Jesus can make you kind. There are some who need to recover from being lazy, and God can make you industrious. 
There are some who need to recover from being a workaholic. Probably nobody in this room. But God can give you balance in your schedule. Some of you need to recover from being selfish. Biggest destructive factor to marriage, in my experience, is selfishness. And God can replace that with unselfishness. Some of you need to stop being stingy and tight. You need to learn how to give graciously. Some of you, now I'm going to really meddle. Some of you need to stop being impatient. And you need to learn patience. You see, this principle is based on the scripture in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, he means sisters as well, in view of God's incredible mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In other words, don't wait till you're dead to be transformed. Start while you're living. Hey. Do not conform, this is your spiritual worship, do not conform any longer to the patterns, the patterns of hurts and habits and hang-ups of this world, but be transformed, how? It tells us right here, by the renewing of your minds. When that occurs, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, what his good, his pleasing, and perfect will is. Key word here is transformation. This is a change of nature, a change of mind. The way we are transformed is by having our, our thinking changed. You see, this has to do with the way we think, not the way we feel. Most important. Most of us have a tendency, the autopilot in our life, when something happens to us, is we tend to make a decision on how we feel, on what just happened to me. And we've got to turn that autopilot off and we've got to willfully choose. I'm going to start to think about my response. I'm going to think about my choice. I'm going to think about my decision. And I want to base it on what I'm thinking so I have the ability to test and approve what is God's perfect will in my life. So we've got to turn off the autopilot of feeling and transition to thinking. This morning, I want to talk about three things. And I found out in the last sermon, I've got to talk really fast again. All right, we're going to try to answer three questions today. Where do my character defects come from? Who do I blame? <laughs> Who do I blame? Number two, why is it so hard to get rid of them? And number three, how do I cooperate or submit, surrender to God's change process and see God transform my hurts, my habits, and my hang-ups? that have been messing up my life. So let's jump in at these questions. Where do my character defects come from? Because we're rather complex, I suggest to you this morning, they come from three areas of our life. A biological source, a sociological source, and a theological source. Let me simplify that. It comes from our chromosomes, our circumstances, and our choices. My chromosomes. Some of them we inherited by nature. My cousin Brenda, she's a few years younger than I am, we grew up together, being very close. And uh, one time, uh, she did something that her mother, my Aunt Ladine, many of you knew Ladine and Connell, she did something that my Aunt Ladine wasn't very happy with. And uh, Brenda was in her mid-teens at the time that this occurred, and my aunt looked at her and said, I have no idea why you would behave like this. And Brenda responded, she said, it's either based upon what I inherited or what I've learned and she was still living at home. <laughs> what she was saying was one of the reasons was my nature. It comes from you. You see, both our mother and our father contributed to our 23 pairs of chromosomes that's in each cell of our body. I am told there are between 30 and 40 trillion cells in the human body. And so we inherited some of the weaknesses from our parents. We inherited some physical defects from them. We inherited some emotional defects from them. This explains our predisposition to certain issues. It doesn't excuse our sin. For instance, because of our parents, we might have a tendency to have a short fuse, a hot temper. Uh, that does not excuse me going out and committing murder. I may have a tendency to be lazy. That doesn't excuse me from doing nothing with my life and being a bum. Maybe we inherited a tendency genetically towards certain addictions. We might more be susceptible to alcoholism or drug addiction. That doesn't excuse me becoming an alcoholic or an addict. But my genes, genetics, my nature is one source of my defects. 
Number two, my circumstances. Remember Brenda said, it's either coming from what I inherited <laughs> or my environment. Okay? What I've learned because of where I lived. This is our nurturing environment is another source. We were raised a certain way. We learned how to relate to people, our patterns of living and our habits. We learned from our parents and we learned from other people around us. We learned to respond to our own needs in certain ways and how to cover up for ourselves, how to handle hurt and rejection. A lot of our defects are simply self-defeating attempts to meet unmet needs. You see, we all have a legitimate need for respect. And if we don't get respect early in life, we settle for attention and we figure out ways to get attention. We have a legitimate need for love, but if we don't get love, we may settle for cheap sex to get an emotional closeness to someone. We have a tendency for security, and if we don't get it, then we use materialism and possessions to show to the world, I'm secure. Uh, a positive thing I learned, by because not, not everything that's, that happens by our nature or by our nurture is bad. You know, our parents not only gave us some bad defects, but they also gave us some good qualities, all right? We learned some good things, not only because of, of, of who we are but uh, by them, but also because of what we've learned from them. And it dawned on me the other day that one of the things that I share in premarital counseling with other couples is, 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 is when you get married, you each have a job. And your job is this. To the husband, it's your job to build a bridge and a relationship to your in-laws, and to the bride, it's your job to build a bridge to your in-laws. Don't just relate to your spouse's family through your spouse. Get to know them. And at one point, I, I tried to figure out, where, where did I learn this? Who taught me this? And I realized, it's not because I'm smart. I didn't figure this out on my own. And nobody really taught it to me out of a book. I learned it by my nurturing this is what I saw in my own family. You couldn't tell the difference between the Rollins and the McLeans except for their appearance. But my grandpa Roland and my grandpa McLean, they were buddies. They were friends. The same cousin Brenda that I'm talking about, she's my cousin on the Roland side. And my grandpa McLean died when I was 10 and she was about 7. But it was in our late 20s that Brenda looked at me one day and she said, Tim, do you know I was 20 years old before I figured out your grandpa McLean was not my grandpa? <laughs> and it's because that's how our families interrelated and we're interconnected to each other. It, 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 it wasn't, all oh, those are the outlaws. No, they were family. So by our chromosomes, by our circumstances, by our nature, by our nurturing, and last, we have our defects also by our choices. My selfish Designs on my own life is another source. If you choose to do something long enough, it becomes a habit. And once it becomes a habit, we're stuck in that rut. Things you never intended to develop in your life develop because you choose to do a certain thing that became a habit. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act. It's a habit. Why does it take so long to get rid of these things? Why is it so difficult? We've all tried fads, right? How many of you have sold in a garage sale uh, the thigh burner? Okay. Hey. It was a fad. You tried it. Okay. How many of you have bought and then sold a treadmill at a garage sale? Okay. Yeah, yeah, a lot of hands going up. All right. I bought two of them probably. We try fads. We try therapies. We try books. We try seminars. Let's go to the second question. Why is it so hard to change defects in my life? I'm going to give you at least a minimum of four reasons today. All right? Number one, because I've had them so long. Number two, my identity is connected to it. Number three, I get some kind of payoff from it. And number four, Satan uses it to keep me discouraged. So number one, I've had them so long. You didn't get rid of them overnight because you didn't get them overnight. It often took months and years to create this habit, and you're not going to lose it really quick. Many of the habits and patterns that we've developed in our childhood, we've learned to become comfortable with, even though they're self-defeating, but they're familiar. It's like an old pair of shoes. They may not be good for running anymore, but they're so comfortable, you just can't get rid of them. So a lot of our defects, we just say, it's the way I am. I'm comfortable in my own skin because we've been this way for so long. 
Another reason it's hard to change is because our identity is connected to these hurts, habits, or hang-ups. We, we confuse who we are with what we do. We say, that's the way I am, I, I, but, but I don't have to be that way. We can't be transformed. It's what Paul says in Romans. When you say, that's the way I am, you're identifying with this defeat. Complete this sentence in your mind. Don't, don't say it out loud. It's just like me to be a blank. Now, for some of you, it's three blanks. Oh, you knew right away where I was going, didn't you? It's just like me to be a workaholic. It's just like me to eat too much. It's just like me to be anxious, passive. It's just like me to be fearful, to lose my temper. What you are is you're setting yourself up and identifying yourself with a defect and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You say, I'm always nervous when I get on planes. And you say that a hundred times as you're on your way to the airport. I'm always nervous when I get on a plane. May I suggest, stop flying. <laughs> or learn by being, by, by a motorhome. <laughs> or realize less people are killed in plane crashes than they are in car wrecks every year. Learn that, really, when you sit down in that chair, you're leaving everything to the airlines. And rest. Because here's the deal. You're sitting next to somebody who's taking a nap on the way. And you're sitting there nervous. What's the difference? You both arrive at the same location, right? You both land. You both get there. Your neighbor next to you is refreshed. And you're worn out. They're ready to start. They join their trip. And you're ready for a nap. All right? So, learn. But stop defeating yourself. That's who I am. What happens is unconsciously, one of the reasons we can't change is because we're afraid if I really let go of this defect, will I still be me? The third reason it's hard is because of payoff. Guys, we're, just because we have hurts, habits, and hangups doesn't mean we're stupid. Sort of. We do these things because there's some kind of payoff or reward for us. It's just what value do we put to this payoff? You see, sometimes, you, you heard Kim say it, sometimes we do this and the payoff is I get to mask my pain. I get to make other people think I'm better than what I am by doing this. Uh, sometimes our hurt, habit, or hang-up gives us an excuse to fail. Sometimes it allows me to compensate for the guilt in my life. Sometimes it, it, it gets me attention that I want or it brings me pleasure that I want or it gives me temporary relief that I want. My defect also may allow me to control and manipulate other people. Anytime a negative behavior is repeated in us or in our kids or anybody, even though it may be self-destructive, th there's always a short-term payoff. It's, usually we don't do anything without some kind of reward. We may never have thought about it that way, but there is at least a short-term payoff. So the payoff, and we don't want to let go. Here's an example of a simple thing. A mother has dinner ready, and she calls up out to the kids who are in their bedroom. Hey, kids, dinner's ready. They ignore her. Hey, kids, dinner's ready. They ignore her. Are you ready? Hey, kids, dinner's ready! And they come right away. The payoff for yelling is a desired response. So mother chooses to create a habit of, Hey, kids, dinner's ready! And she continues to yell. Because there's a payoff. There's a reward. Last of all, Satan discourages us. You remember the old cartoons that had the two little guys on each shoulder? One, one guy on each shoulder, one of them with a little pitchfork tail and, you know, little pointed ears, a little poker. And the other guy, very angelic looking, all right, and they're whispering in each ear. There's more truth than comedy to that scenario. That's exactly what Paul talks about in the book of Romans in chapters 5 and 6 and the things that that... I don't do, I want to do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do do. There's this 
battle going on. There's these voices. Satan is always in our ear trying to discourage us from recovery. He's trying to let us know that we're stuck. Who do you think you are that you can get over this? Who do you think you are that you think you can change? Forget it. Other people can change, but not you. You're hopeless. Don't even think about changing. He's just always talking negative. If you get rid of this, you're going to go crazy. You'll self-destruct. Bible says, what about Satan, though? Bible says that Satan is a liar, and he's lying to you every time. So let's look at the truth. How do I submit to God's change process in my life? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is a good beginning place for us. It's a good jumping off place. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We've got to start with how we think. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a person thinketh, so are they. Thoughts should influence our feelings rather than, in, than feelings influence our actions. This requires the Holy Spirit of God to be in residence within the human spirit of man to bring about the recovery that we so desperately need. But he not only needs to be in residence in our life, but we must allow the Holy Spirit, the person of Christ in us, to be reigning as well. We need to let Jesus sit on the throne, the place of authority in our life, rather than keeping locked in the closet. You see, the role of the Holy Spirit of God within the human spirit of man is to do three things. And just quickly, let me, let me chase a small rabbit. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's when the presence of God comes to live within the human spirit of each one of us. It's not about religious activity or religious fervor. It's not about, about a mounting list or, 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 or mountain of good deeds that eventually overcomes the mountain of bad things that we've done in our life. The thief on the cross is our greatest example. He only had time before his death to do one thing. Believe in his heart the Lord Jesus and confess with his mouth. Some of you are saying that's two, that's really one. The belief in the heart, all right, is where it has to start and then it's expressed, all right? It's faith. The thief on the cross expressed it and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. His life didn't last any longer on earth, <laughs> but his life was a whole lot better after death. Hey, that's what it means to be a Christian. Christ in you. Christ in me. The Holy Spirit in residence in our human spirit. And when that is functional, then the Holy Spirit will teach our minds and now control our emotions and then so direct our will that he changes our behavior and we will overcome every hurt, every habit, and every hang up we have when we allow the Holy Spirit to reign in us. Teach our minds, control our emotions, and direct our will. In this way, according to God's intended design in purpose, the way he created Adam in the very beginning, the way that Jesus was born. Those are the examples, all right, of how God designed us to be. Adam messed it up, Jesus perfected it. So what he intends to do is he wants to govern our behavior in us by being the origin of his own image, by being the source of his own activity, by being the dynamic of his own demands. Tim, what in the heck does that mean? If God is the origin of his own image, then when others look at us, they see him. If Christ in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit, functioning the way he intended to in our human spirit, he then is the source of his own activity. It is Christ living in, to, through, and for me. If he is the dynamic of his own demands, it is his strength to accomplish his will, not mine. I can't. You never said I could. You can. Always said you will. This is the principle that Jesus tried to teach to us that Adam failed in doing. In a perfect environment, Adam failed. In an imperfect world, Jesus succeeded. How? Jesus made this very clear. Jesus said, every word you hear me say, every physical act you see me do, it is not me, Jesus, as man doing it, but it is my Father living in me in the presence of the Holy Spirit, doing what he designed me to do when he allowed me to be born on the face of this earth. And as my Father sent me with all that he is to accomplish everything that he wants in my life, so send I you out into the world. I will send you into the world in the power of my life, everything I demand of you, I will be the origin and the dynamic activity to accomplishment. Will you let him? That is the question for us today. Origin, source, dynamic.
And then last of all, he will be the cause of his own effect. In other words, the results are his responsibility, not yours. Will you let him? That brings us to seven ways to change. Seven ways to change our minds so we can cooperate, submit to, with the way God wants to change us and make us what he's always wanted us to be. And here's where I got to fly. Seven things. Number one, focus on changing one flaw at a time. Proverbs 17, 24 says, an intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool takes off in many directions. Some of you are coming to recovery and thinking, this is great. I've got 30 things on my list to change. Don't do that. It's overwhelming. You'll get discouraged and nothing will change. Be specific. What I would say you do is to pray to God and say, God, what specifically do you want to work in in my life right now? You don't just pray, God, I want to be a better person. You say, God, I'm angry, and I'm tired of being angry. God, I lust all the time. I'm tired of being a guy who lives like that. Be specific. Be very specific. God, this is what I want you to work in my life on. Use your moral inventory. We talked about last week in step four. Go down that list and say, God, where do you want to start? And let him start there. Number two, focus on one victory at a time. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 11, give us this month our monthly bread. Is that the way that verse reads? How does it read? Give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because you see, God's promise to us is strength and sufficiency for today. Don't let yesterday's sin keep you struggling because nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ that we sang about cleansed all those sins away. Don't live in yesterday and don't anticipate the problems of tomorrow because you know what? Tomorrow may never ever come. Live today. That's like the old saying, how to eat an elephant. One bite at a time. Man, you look at the size of the elephant, you'll never get through him. One bite at a time. Somebody else wrote an interesting cliche phrase. Life by the yard is hard, but by the inch, it's a cinch. I like that. You take a lifetime problem, you didn't get it overnight, you hurt your habit, you hang up, you break it down into bite-sized pieces, and you work on it today. You trust God's strength today. Pray when you get up in the morning something like this. Lord, just for this day, I want to be patient. Lord, just for today, I want to think pure thoughts instead of lust. Lord, just for today, I don't want to lose my temper. Lord, today, I want to be more positive than negative. Thank God for his strength, presence, and sufficiency for the next hour of this day. Take a little bit at a time. This keeps us from making rash vows that we can't keep. I promise never to do it again. You're doomed for failure, and that will lead you to deeper discouragement. If you have a boss that's a real jerk, and he tends to bring out the bad in you, you tend to get resentful. I hope Mark doesn't pray this prayer. (laughs) But get up in the morning and say, Lord, just for the first three hours this morning, may I respond to him or her how you would want to respond. I don't want to get up tight, resentful, but I want to respond with a smile. Matthew 6, 34 says, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Rome wasn't built in a day. Character won't be built in a day. We want instant everything. Mashed potatoes, instant coffee, microwave popcorn. And we also want instant maturity. Spiritual maturity is not instant. Salvation is. Maturity is not. But we want to go from being a mess one day to Billy Graham the next doesn't happen that way. We grow by inches. We grow by days, one day at a time. Number three, focus on God's power, not my power or willpower. We already know willpower is not enough. Some of you are saying, I got this. It's really not that big a deal. I can handle this. If it was not a big deal, you wouldn't still have the problem. Don't say, I can master this, but rather pray, God, I can master this in your strength. I'm one who is really visual. I, I, I can read about things, I, but, but I really somehow need to, to get a visual to, to really fully understand things. Some of you have heard me tell before, when I find myself as a pastor in difficult situations, whether it was a police chaplain having to deliver a death notification to a family at 2 a.m. in the morning, whether it was a hospice call, It was my first visit, and I had no idea what their response might be. Anytime I left one of those, I always tried to think on the way home, 
God, if, if the roles were reversed, if that was a chaplain knocking on my door at 2 o'clock in the morning to tell me that my son had been killed, how would you want to respond to me? So visual helps me. So try to visualize whatever your hurt, habit, or hang-up is. The worst one on your list. The one you think God wants to work on right now. Kind of, kind of do this with me in your mind. Pull it out. Walk to your kitchen trash can. And drop it in. Get your tie. And tie the top of that bag. Now pull it out of the trash can and take it out. T- to the can outside. Put it in. It's trash day. Wheel it out to the curb. Set it at the curb. And stand there until the truck comes. And when the truck arrives, you see on the side of a truck a big promo sign that says, God and Son doing business with people like you for 2,000 years. Jesus sends out the arm of that truck and it clamps onto that big dumpster and it lifts it up and it pours it out. And it drives away, taking your garbage with it. That's what it means to think about giving our hurts, habits, and hang-ups to God. I'm throwing them in the can, and I'm letting him do something. Here's the problem, though. Some of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, our kitchen trash can isn't big enough. Our backyard can isn't large. We need to ask for a special delivery of a dumpster. But he'll come and do the same with it. Willpower doesn't work. God's power does. Number four, focus on what God wants, not what I want. Philippians 4, eight. fix your thoughts on what is true, good, and right. Think about what is pure. Here, here's part of the problem. We look at the problem and say, I'm not going to do, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to steal anymore. I'm not going to steal anymore. I'm not going to steal anymore. I'm not going to think about sex. I'm not going to think about sex. I'm not going to think about sex. What are all of you thinking about right now? <laughs> Stealing sex, I know. I know. <laughs> But you focus. No, what God says is think about my word and what it says. So here's the challenge, guys. And some of you are going to say, I'm too old to do this. No, you're not. Memorize scripture. There are 7,000 promises in the Bible. Pick 52. It's not even 10%. Pick 52. Memorize one a week for the next year. You can do this. That way, When temptation comes, when the hurt, habit, and hang-up raises its ugly head, now, instead of thinking about it, you can go to the promises that you have hidden in your heart. Number five, focus on doing the right thing, not feeling the right thing. I love this quote out of AA. It's a popular phrase in AA. Fake it until you make it. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, in other words, don't wait till you feel like it's the right thing to do. If it is the right thing to do, just do it, whether you feel like it or not. And you do it long enough, you will feel right because it was right. Here's the deal. If you make bad decisions because it felt right, it will never be right. But if you do what is right, even though it doesn't feel right in time, it will feel right. It works one direction. It doesn't work the other direction. You'll just end up with a lot of guilt. Um, I've heard husbands say to me in my office sometimes, Tim, I just don't love my wife anymore. And I say, what loving things are you doing for her? Well, I don't love her, so I'm doing none. Okay, start doing some loving things. If you do the right thing, it's amazing how God will bring the emotions to match that which is right. Number six, focus on people who help you, not hinder you. Focus on people who help you, not hinder you. In other words, you may have to change your friends for a while. You may have to avoid family for a while. Do you get to a place of spiritual maturity that they don't hold you back? The Bible says it like this. Bad company corrupts good character. So watch out. And, and, and high school kids, if your parents don't like some of your friends, trust them for a while. Trust them for a while. All right? Uh, here's what I also know since I've been on a diet for seven months. Really good cooks corrupt healthy diet plans. <laughs> I'm very mad at the, uh, act, uh, at, at, uh, the Addises right now. I have six boxes of Girl Scout cookies at my house right now. I'm very angry at, um, at Allie Longstaff right now. She brought four dozen Timmy Doodles to Super Bowl Sunday last week. I hate it. You see, 
we got to avoid bad company and bad places. If you're struggling with alcoholism, don't say, you know, I think I'll go down to the bar. They got really good peanuts. That's a bad, bad idea. If you're struggling with pornography, don't go into a strip joint. That is a bad, bad idea. And, and, and on the heels of that, recovery does happen in good, healthy relationships, never on your own. Let, let me illustrate, and I know I've got to wrap this up. There were probably many of you last week who said when you left here, I'm going to go home and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to talk to God and I'm going to write out my moral inventory. How many of you did? Yeah, four or five of you. I, I, two, two, two of you came to see me this week. It was good. It was very refreshing. I was so stunned by some of the things I heard from folks who came to see me this week. I hope they never, ever come back to New Hope again. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a big joke, guys. That's a big joke. No, it was, it was, but, 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 what, but see, it was fun. They, they couldn't do it by themselves. Just to take the inventory without going to talk to somebody. But two of the people who came to see me said, Pastor, we're here for confessional. I said, I don't have the right caller. I'm that's not what I do. But we, I said, okay, you need to tell somebody, right? Because it's what we talked about last week. Because this is done. Tell God and tell somebody else. Pick the right somebody else, okay? Pick the right somebody else. Some of you need somebody to come alongside of you and you need to tell them, I need to do the moral inventory and tell them, hold me accountable. Ask me in three days, did I do it? Ask me three days after that, have I done it? Keep asking me until I do it. The Bible said, God who begins a good work in you will keep right on growing you in his grace until the task is finally finished. Number seven, this is it. Focus on progress, not perfection. Some of you are thinking that God will only love you once you get to a certain stage in the process. Perfection, wrong. God loves each of us at every stage. He will never love us more than he does right now, and he will never love us less than he does right now. So remember, we are the product of a biological source, a sociological source, and a theological source. My chromosomes, my nature. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, we have a new nature. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us for glory and for goodness. My circumstances, my nurture is another source. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how to stimulate each other to love and good deeds, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. And you have it. You're here today. This is the manner of some. But we can exhort one another and so much more as that day is getting closer. Matthew 18, 20 says, where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I'll be very active in your presence. Walk in fellowship with each other. And then my choices. How do I deal with this? Joshua 24 says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I assure you, believers, by the pride which I have in you, your union with Christ, Paul says, I die to self every day, one day at a time. He goes on to say in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him, I've shared his crucifixion. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, reigning, not just in residence. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, adhering to, relying on, completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So with this, I'll close. We sang this just this morning. Like a mighty storm, stir within my soul. Lord, have your way in me. Is God creating a storm in your life? Because he's exposed in recent weeks, hurts, habits, hang-ups, issues that you've just said, that's just the way I am. And the Spirit brings conviction saying, but I don't want to leave you the way you are. He loves us too much to do that. Why don't you pray as we close in prayer? Lord, have your way in me. Our Father, thank you for teaching us in your word that there is a road to recovery. The scripture says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. But there's a way. There's a road. It's a road to recovery that we need to discover. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way to the truth, and I am the truth about the life. And the life that I lived, 
my father and me, I now want to send you out into the world to live that life with me in you. Lord, I'm ready to let you do that. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.